Good morning. Nice to see you. Uh, as of, I understand, this sometime tomorrow, we will be able to put your masks away again for a couple of days, maybe. See how it goes. This morning, I want to uh, share a few things with you. Obviously, that's why I'm here. Uh, but I'm still trying to make up my mind exactly where the Lord wants me to start. So you'll, you'll notice here I've got some bags. Okay, right. So we'll get to those in a minute. Last year, uh, I had the pleasure of being confined to home, like most of you, and we decided that we would make the most of that time that we were stuck at home. So we did something clever. We started to work on our home, renovating. We did gardens. We did garden edges. We did paving. I built steps. We... um, We did a a whole range of things and I decided that now, while the sun was out, would be a really good time at that point when the sun was out, was a good time to paint. Right. Okay. So just in case you're not sure, I still make silly decisions, right? So I decided that we would paint. We were going to paint our whole house uh, from one end to the other, from top to the very bottom. So we picked up our colours, we'd chosen what we wanted to do, and away we went. So we started. So I decided to start at the top because then I could get off the ladder and put it away. All right? Good idea. I thought that was a good idea. So while we were up there painting, uh, I put some paint on. It was lovely grey paint. I can't tell you the colour of it. I can't remember. But anyway, we're painting away and I'm rolling this and I'm painting that and I'm touching it up and I'm filling up all the little gaps with the gap filler so that it it looks pretty because no one will ever see it. No one gets up that high anyway, but that's what you do. And I had a little blister of paint, just a tiny little blister of paint on a corner edge. So what do you do with a little blister of paint? I can tell you now you leave it alone. (laughs) But I didn't leave it alone because I didn't really realise what it would do. But it happens to fit comfortably into my message this morning. Um, I got my scraper, which was seriously sharp. I like to use sharp tools. uh, And I went nick. And the paint went off. It didn't just come off in a little bit. It came off in streams. Now, our house was built in 1930 sometime. And it was moved to our home, to our block. And it's been painted on several different occasions. But when I went click and nicked this little piece off and it peeled off, it went all the way back to the original stuff because our house was built with fibro sheet. So when the paint came off, it all came off. So I had to peel our gable ends off on the ladder. It took quite a bit of time. But the good news is it just peeled off. And then I had to repaint it. So I had to prime it and paint it on several coats. So that was that piece of paint. The moral of that story is the paint, there was more than enough paint there, but it couldn't handle it anymore. It technically became baggage for the house. More paint, paint on top of paint creates excess work and excess load. New paints and old paints, they don't go together. So it fell off. It fell off on a number of different places all around the house as I would paint. So I'd have it painted. I'd step back. I'd say, that looks nice. And then I'd see a blister. And I knew, now I knew what it meant. It meant start all over again, Rod, peel it all off and start again. How many of you in your life would like to peel off a few layers and start again? So... I'm more than comfortable to say that there would be a number of you sitting in here this morning that would like to be able to drop a few things off and start all over again. So the next little piece I want to share with you is how many of you can remember going on a trip? Going on a trip. Now, yeah, that's right. Barb went on a trip recently and managed to come back. Uh, When you go on a trip, what do you do? Pack your bags. One of the things I like about aeroplanes is you can only pack a bag to a certain weight. 
So if you're, uh, which, who, hands up those that are overpackers, right? Hands up those that are underpackers because no one packs just enough, all right? So the rest of you, you don't know what you are, okay? Because you're sitting there and saying, oh, I always pack exactly what I need, which is not true. So you always get there and you've got more than you're going to put on or less. But when we go, if we go in the caravan, uh, the caravan has no load limit. You know, you can load a caravan till the springs sag. Um, yeah, till you can't drive it. You can change your car if it's too loaded. So you can overpack your caravan. And this morning, uh, I want to talk to us about the overpackaging that you and I have in our lives. So it's not like New Year's resolutions and that sort of thing. I just want to share with you this morning the importance of being able to put things off. So I just want to start, I'll just pray with you. Lord, as we gather together this morning, I pray that we would be bold enough to declare that we need to unload. I pray that we would be strong enough to rely on the name of Jesus to help us put things off that we carry. Things that we've dragged around for years, Lord, I pray that we would be able to unload this morning. I pray, Lord, with an expectation that you, Holy Spirit, are here with us and that you want to minister to each and every one. And I do believe without a shadow of doubt, Lord, that your word is true and faithful and we can believe what we read. And I pray that as we apply what we read today into our lives, we will be transformed, Lord, and lives will be changed. So I want to give you thanks for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're not sure, I have here, this is a new bag. Nice. This bag's never been opened. The seal is not broken. This is a new bag. This is its brother. This bag has been opened and it hasn't been used much, so it's not a very old bag. And we've got a few people in our, in our uh, church this morning that are not very old. Some of you are just babies. Uh, there's a couple of babies around. There's a few running around, which is lovely. I love seeing the kids at church. But I want to tell you that the babies have already got a little bit of baggage. So when you unload these little things, you never know what you're going to find in them. Look what I found in this one. He's cute. Uh, he came from the op shop. He's $4 if you want to buy him later. Uh, anyone need any really old? Uh, these look like knobs off a drawer. So you get the picture, don't you? What happens with bags is we put stuff in them. What I want to suggest this morning is it doesn't matter how old you are, there are things in your life that you're carrying now that if you're not careful, you can carry all of your life. And we need to be able to assist our young ones so that they don't end up like this bag. <clears throat> oh, you couldn't hear that, could you? Just to let you know, that bag is actually heavy. I wasn't faking that. And that's what happens. These are good bags, aren't they? I'm not advertising coals, but the good thing with this bag is you can load it up. It does what it's supposed to do. You bring it home and you unload it. You fold it up and you pop it somewhere where you'll forget to take it next time you go to the supermarket. That's why you end up with dozens of those bags. So they're good bags. I would suggest to you this morning that a lot of us have got these, these big heavy ones. And this morning, I want to share with you ways to get rid of them. So the first scripture I have up there is, is Corinthians. And it says, when I was a child, I think that's what it says. Yep. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13 11. And then in Ephesians 4, it says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, which is hatred. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
Another translation of that same scripture is, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And all the people said, Amen. Because we agree with that, don't we? But the challenge this morning is, how well have you done that? How well... Have you got it through your life with getting rid of bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander? Uh, I can tell you from personal experience that these are easier things said than done. Um, Many of you know my life story. So I used to struggle with anger. I used to struggle with rage. I could get quite irritated, quite annoyed, quite aggressive, uh, all kinds of those sorts of things. Um, I've had in my life issues with um, lies. I've not always been a truth teller. Uh, But what's worse than that is when people lie about you, uh, lie what you, they make up falsehoods about you. Uh, They're hard to deal with and I've had that experience. I think I told you once that I had a, a person who spoke badly about me all over the place after they left our church, which was okay. Uh, And I had resolved myself that this matter was completely resolved in my mind because the Lord told me clearly that I was to let it go. Now, I thought I was good at letting it go. And if I've told you this story, forgive me, but some of you haven't heard it. One day I was minding my own business and I was on the train. Now, I'm not a trained person. Colin's a trained person. but uh, And Ron, Ron's a mad trained person. He loves them. I think Ray's good at it too. But anyway, I got in this train, I was coming home from Melbourne and this person who had berated me got in the train. Now, just guess where God allowed this person to sit. (laughs) Not next to me, no. No, praise God, it wasn't next to me. Uh, I'll just, can I demonstrate? Uh, I'll just demonstrate. So I'm going to go off camera for a minute because I'm demonstrating. Say this seat's turned around the other way. She sat, it was a woman, she sat there. (laughs) Now I wanted to beat her up. (laughs) Suddenly I did. And I thought I was resolved. I thought the issue was all gone. But I could feel myself thinking, great. And then she asked me how I was. So from, I think it was Caulfield, All the way to Frankston, I was pleasant and I was struggling and I was pleasant and I was struggling and I bid her farewell and I got in my car and I thought, well, Lord, I didn't handle that very well. And I thought, I need to fix that. So I needed to deal with that issue in my own life. So I had to go home and pray about that and Seek some wise counsel and get that sorted out. So you can be relaxed now. I'm over that. It's done. Now I can talk about it without any any harm. But I want to encourage you that I've dealt with it, and I'm sure that many of you have as well. But the Lord's in the business of restoring us and setting people free and giving us an opportunity to progress and go forward because we don't want to stay where we are. So this morning... I want to share another thing that Romans um, 8, 1 says, and you don't have it up there, so relax on that. It says, in Jesus, there is no condemnation for our past mistakes. All right. It doesn't say it exactly like that. It says, there is no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that's really what it means, isn't it? That we have been set free. We've been set free from all sorts of things, all sorts of issues have now been, we've been released from them because hands up all those that are new creations. Yeah, everyone's a new creation. The minute you receive Christ, the scripture says, all things have passed away and we have become new. So we're new, but we then have to deal with the old. It's like putting paint, new paint on old paint. You have to deal with that properly. Um, I, I could go on with paint forever about the things that I've learned and how it is with our own lives. You can't put, for example, um, new paint on shiny paint. 
you know that gloss paint? Gloss cut paint can be 30 years old and it still will reject fresh paint. You need to rub it back. You need to give it a scrub. Now there's a product you can paint on and let you paint over it. But you know, in God, that's called repentance and forgiveness and restoration and recovery. And they're the things that God's going to do for you as he picks up your life and helps you to work your way through it. So this morning, I want to share some of the things that I've been looking at over the week in regard to baggage and how to deal with it and what sort of baggage it is. So the first thing you need to know this morning is you need to know the issue that you have. Some years ago, it's a long time ago now, I had an issue, as I said, with rage and anger. Uh, You look at me now and you think, nah, but I could have. I could have really hurt most of you a long time ago. Praise God that none of that works anymore. So you have to know your issue. Now, I had no idea what was going on. One day someone said to me, there's a spirit of murder on you, Rod. You need to deal with that. So again, we were able to deal with that. The good news is all these things God can deal with. All you have to do is be prepared. So I've just got a list of nine things. Nine things. We're going to do nine things this morning. You ready? Broken all the cardinal rules of preaching. Only supposed to do three, maybe five. So we'll quickly do nine. So the first one, we all carry a sin. Every one of us has got some element in our lives of sin, okay? So the next one is anxiety. Uh, And congratulations to Colin. These are really good little things. And we'll get back to them in a minute. So we're going to skip through them and then go back again, all right? So the next one's a bag of anxiety. Then we've got uh, anger. Anyone anxious? Anyone an anxious person in the room? I'm staring at you, Ron. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Better? Good. So we prayed for Ron last week for this. We took authority over it. I gave him a dose of power. And we prayed for him last week. And there's power in this oil uh, because this oil, we've, we've given it over to the Lord, prayed that the Lord would bless and strengthen it. So anointing oil. Anger and bitterness. I won't ask who's got that because it might scare us all. Anyone in the room worry about things that you shouldn't worry about? Some people worry about everything and um, there's nothing you can do about it. There's uncertainty of the future. Anyone struggling with what your future is going to look like? There's doubt and distrust. Now, I use the word distrust because it talks about people. If you look up in the Webster, the word distrust, it talks about a lack of trust in people, all right, not mistrust. They're two different, they're the same words, roughly the same meaning, but this one talks about people. The next one is fear, insecurity and inadequacy. Anyone, anyone feel insecure or inadequate? Most people feel inadequate. Uh, and that's, I think we need to be able to, we need to deal with that. And the best way to deal with that is a bit more encouragement. We need to encourage people a little bit more, okay? And I'll deal with those in a sec. And then there's the fear of failure. We all love that one, don't we? That's why we don't start things. If I start it, I've got to finish it, but I might fail when I do it. So there's an issue that we can have. So honestly, these are just the tip of the iceberg. We could go on and on about issues that people carry, but the truth is God wants to help you deal with them as you make your way through. If that's my Ford, just take my keys, Tom. If it's not, take the hammer. Yeah. It sound, did I tell you about my car on the ferry? No. Yeah, don't put a Ford Ranger, which is fully armed, an alarm system, on the mezzanine deck of the ferry going to Queens because it's got motion sensors in it. And when it does that in the water, it turns every Ford, every Ford Ranger on the ferry that we were on was parked on the mezzanine deck. <laughs> and they're all going nuts. So we were, th- we were sitting back, relaxed, thinking it's not our car. We've heard our car go off. Yeah. And then the man on the, mach- on the PA system said, would all the Ford Ranger owners go and turn off your cars? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a fear of failure. Insecurity and inadequacy came up. Fear was another one. And a little bit of anger. They all just... <laughs> So I want to help you start. This is what you do once you have a look at your life and you say, well, like, I've got some of these issues. The first thing, there's a few ideas to help you get rid of them. 
uh, once you've identified the process. Bring it before the Lord. How many of you pray about your life? There's so many people, good. There are so many people, though, that pray about other people and you don't pray about yourself. And I want to encourage you this morning, we need to be praying for ourselves. We need to be lifting ourselves into the presence of God and, and believing God for great things, all right? We really do. And we need to bring the process. Sometimes you can't handle things on your own. They don't work on your own. So we need to bring them before, the, before our friends. You've got some trusted friends? You need to find some trusted people that you can sit with and share, share your life with so that you can be, get these issues resolved. There's a couple of scriptures for you that, again, you don't have, Pat, so don't worry. Uh, where there is no guidance, a people fall. But in an abundance of counsellors, there is safety, Proverbs 11, 14. Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you will be wise, Proverbs 19, 20. And plans are established by seeking advice, Proverbs 20, verse 18. And the last thing I've got here to share with you on that area is bring it into the light. Bring it before the Lord. Confess, your, confess the situation. You're in. I had to go home after that train trip and pray and confess that, Lord, I didn't handle that well. I didn't feel good about it. And I, didn't, I actually thought it was resolved, but I hadn't resolved it properly. I had to just lay it out before the Lord. Once I did that, it's, I'm okay with that now. So once you've identified these things, we need to be able to then do something about them. Now, I've got a scripture here in 1 John 1, 6 to 9. And it says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise in 1 John 1, 6 to 9. This is the promise of God. That's what God promises to do for you and me this morning if you find that there are areas in your life that you really need to deal with. And I want to suggest to us this morning that we all have something that we need to sort out. We all have areas and issues in our lives that we need to deal with. The great thing is, who's got a Bible? Everyone got a Bible. You've got more than one. I know about you. You've got dozens of Bibles and you enjoy every one of them, which is great. And it's good to know that you can read one, read another, read another, and that way you get an understanding, a greater understanding of what the Word has to say. So this morning, I want to share with you. So we'll go back to our first slide, which is a bag of sin, please. There you go. Did you know there's a scripture for this? You can deal with this today. If there's sin in your life that's unresolved, you can deal with that right now this morning as I speak. You don't need to come up the front. You don't need to do anything. You can pray, Lord, while I'm speaking if you want to. But it says this, if we confess our sins, this is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what it says. So if there's any unrighteousness in your life this morning, you can pray, Lord, help me let it go this morning. Help me, Lord, to put it aside. I want to be better than I am. Anxiety. Now, anxiety is a terrible thing. Anxiety, according to Scripture, can ruin your life, can ruin your bones, can ruin your body. Anxiety has to work its way out of you somehow. So if you hold it in, it will work its way out through your joints. It can work its way out through your thoughts. It can do all sorts of things. It can twist you up. But the good news is, according to 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Isn't that good news? God cares for you. So if you're anxious about anything, say, Lord, I'm, here it is. I can't do anything about it. Help me, Lord, just to put this at rest. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with gratitude, make your requests known to God. 
See, you can ask the Lord for help. Lord, this is what I'm about to do. This is what I'm about to do. If you're like me, and many of us are, uh, you find yourself in a position and then you pray. But if you're honest, you try and fix it first and then you pray. Often it's not prayer that is the first thing we do. But we need to, I want to encourage you in 2021. I think 2020 has taught us something. It's that life is very unpredictable and that we should spend a bit more time in preparation and in preparationary prayer. And Psalm 94, 19 says, When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. So the joy of the Lord brings us peace. So we need to find peace when we're anxious. What about anger and bitterness? Got a bag of that? If you've got a bag of that, well, then Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry, be angry. God says, be angry, get as mad as you want, but do not sin. In other words, take charge of your anger. Because if you don't deal with anger properly, it can do all kinds of things. I used to say to Roz, "I, I just need a big bit of wood and I could whack that person on the head. And... And I found that if I didn't say that out loud, I let those thoughts fester in my, in my head because we're not pure. We're not, we're not that self-righteous that we don't have these thoughts. Let's be real. You know, we do have these thoughts. You think, oh, bang, that'll fix that. Uh, and many of you have probably said, Rod, I'd like to bang you on the head, and that's okay. <laughs> now, I have no problem with that whatsoever, as long as you don't. But, and that's where it comes back to, but sin not. Deal with that properly. And sometimes to deal with it properly, again, you need your trusted friend where you can say, look, this is how I feel. If you're not honest with how you feel with someone, then you're going to be in quite a bit of trouble. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. I have, Ros and I have believed this for a very long time. We used to, we would sit up and talk issues through before we go to bed so that we didn't sleep on it. Because when you go to bed angry, you don't sleep well anyway. And when you wake up in the morning, it's worse. It's got worse. So we need, and that's why scripture says, you know, the Bible doesn't say these things because it thinks it's funny. It says these things because they're true. God wants to deal with your life and he can. Proverbs 29.11 says, fools give full vent to their rage but the wise bring calm in the end. Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, now forgiving each other, just as in God forgave you. I've repeated that scripture three times, if you're not sure. And that's because I think it's an important scripture. We need to... Deal with all these areas in our lives. And God can help you. Now, when you get it wrong, do yourself a favour. Remember, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. It enables you to get it wrong and then start all over again. You're, as long as you deal with getting it wrong properly, if you wrong somebody, fix it. Go and sort that to that person. Sort that out. Deal with these things and then you can move forward. Uh, Where are you now? Thank you very much. Worry. There are a lot of people that worry about things, worry about things that you can't do anything about. But in Isaiah 26, it says, 26 verse 3, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So when you start to worry about things, can I just encourage you? I can say this because this is not my, this is not an aspect of my life. I try not to worry about too many things. I've decided I can't change much, so I just have to let it happen and work my way through it. But the best way to do that is to give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, here it is. I can do nothing more. Uh, I surrender it to you, and try and find something else to think about. 
No, that's all you can do. That's really all you can do with that, but you need to get into the Lord. What about uncertainty of your future? And it hands up all those that are fully aware of your future, you have no control over. You think you do, right up until you break your ankle, or right up until you uh, change your job, or someone comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says, hi, uh, we don't need you here anymore, off you go. Uh, all those things have, not all of those things, but some of those things have happened to me. And you just, now what? What do I do now? I would suggest if you're a bag of worrier, uh, you'll worry about it forever. If you're anxious, you'll start to get anxious about it. But if you've given all that over, you'll pray about it and you'll say, Lord, what door are you going to open now? And wait for the door to open. God always opens the door. I just want to tell you this now because it's just shot into my mind. I remember a fellow by the name of Ray Swanborough. And Ray Swanborough wanted to buy a house in Crib Point because he wanted to live there. No one knows why, but he did. He wanted to live in Crib Point. It's better now, but right back then, every mosquito in Australia was bred in Crib Point. <laughs> and uh, so Ray wanted to live in Crib Point. So he said to the Lord, Lord, uh, we need to buy a house. And he laid it out with a time limit. He said, at such and such a day, at such and such a time... If it didn't happen, we were never going to live there. Now, that can either be very brave or rather foolish because when does God arrive? Just after you cut off time. And that's what happened to Ray, but he actually hung around and he didn't leave. And it was just after that time limit that God gave him. There was a place for him. It was all open, available and he was able to move forward. And his life has gone on from there. So praise the Lord. But just be careful. In the Old Testament, they threw out a fleece. Remember the fleece throwing? Right. All those that live in the Old Testament, put your hands up. You might visit the Old Testament, but I promise you, you're living in the New. And in the New Testament, we don't throw out a fleece. We come before the Lord and we ask and lay things out before God and say, here we are, Lord. This is what we want. There's scripture that encourages us not to put the Lord to the test in those things. So a bag of un, uncertainty for the future, it says this in Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you. You all know this scripture, don't you? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Isn't that the best scripture? A future filled with hope. Praise God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love, love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What one's that? Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28, exactly. These are the scriptures that you apply into your life. When you don't understand what's going on, when you don't know what your future is, you pray, Lord, I have to trust you. And I know it sounds easy, but... I believe me, I've worked through nearly all of this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not this bag here. I'm not this brand spanking new one. Uh, unfortunately, I've been around a little while and I've, I've had to live through nearly all of the things that I'm just speaking to you about this morning. We've had times where we had no work, where I had, didn't have a job, um, wasn't very long because we would go and hunt for a job and find a job. Um, if you have no plan, it makes life hard. Those of you that are at school, if you've got no idea what you want to do when you leave school, uh, it makes school really hard work. But if you've got a purpose at the end, if you can see a plan, you can, that'll give you a reason to move yourself forward. The good thing is that plan can always change, but you've still got somewhere to go. So I want to encourage you. And that's like life is now. Uh, life changes all the time, doesn't it? Last week, we could all run and jump and leap and bounce. This year, only half of us can. Because we've grown up, we've got older, things change. So anyone with a bag of doubt and distrust, do you struggle with people? Do you look at people and go, think side, go sideways? Hmm, I don't know about that one. 
Um, one thing the Lord gave me, which I really praise God for and thank him for, is I like to accept people exactly as I find you. So if you're here and, I've, and I meet you, I'm going to accept you just as I hear you speak and, and I, no prejudging. Uh, if you want to tell me your story as you go along, fine, that's good. Um, I just trust the Lord has brought good people, right people amongst us. And as we can do that, we move forward. Uh, I have, you might want to know, on several occasions suggested to people that you're in the wrong church and asked people to leave. All right? That's because I'm the pastor. It's the pastor's job, isn't it, to protect the sheep? So sometimes you have to do that. It's not anywhere near as simple as it sounds. It can be quite, a, quite hard. But if you're in the wrong place and the, and the Lord wants you to move, well, then we can, if that's how it is, we need to be able to work on that. But I don't distrust people and I don't carry doubt around about people either. So I praise God. But there are others in the room that may. So if you do, here's a few scriptures for you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Jesus answered them truly and said, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what I do, uh, to, what I, sorry, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea, it will be done for you. Now, I've never cast a mountain into the sea, but I have dropped some mountains out of my own life. And I've used that scripture. When I've seen things that I've believed were insurmountable, I've been able to pray, Lord, I rebuke that. I move that mountain in Jesus' name. And things move. <coughs> they really do. They don't move as quickly as you want or as I want. God is sometimes likes to test you, see how you're going. <coughs> you know, you're going to hang in there, Rod? You're going to hang in or you're going to quit? Which one are you? Uh, sadly, there are a lot of people that have given up on the Lord because he didn't meet them when, he, when they wanted him to. But, you know, God never leaves and he's never going to forsake us. So we need to encourage people with that. What about fear? Bag of fear. Here's some scriptures for fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. I preached this last year. God has not given to us a spirit of fear. Who did? The enemy did. The world did. People around us did. So what do we do with fear? If it's not of God, we get rid of it. We can deal with it because God said, I gave you power and love and self-control. 2 Timothy 1.7. Isaiah 4, 41, 13 to 14 says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, do not fear. I will help you. Do not fear. How close is the Lord? The right hand. If you put your right hand out, there's the Lord. He's that close. So we can praise God that he's never too far away. When fear comes, we can say, Lord, help me. We've all had areas of fear, haven't we? We've all had this experience. So I just want to encourage you, though, to keep hanging in. Bag of insecurity. Anyone insecure? Feeling inadequate? This scripture, I'll read these ones first. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ. This, the, uh, the, depth, the scripture I have here is, I can do all things because of Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, what things can I do? I can do everything in Christ. Everything I can do in Christ. And this has got to do with, Life issues. This has got nothing to do with I can do somersaults and I can leap off a building. It's got nothing to do with that. This is to deal with your, your own personal move forward in the things of God. If, you lack, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives sparingly, just a little tiny bit at a time. He drips it out, drop at a time. Is that how the scripture goes? No, he gives it out liberally in abundance He'll flood you with it. He'll wash over you with it without criticism. 
and it will be given to you, James 1.5. This is what happens for, for us. With, And I said it earlier today, I believe that inadequacy, we need to encourage people more. Every one of us, we need to, there's a book on encouragement and we need to grab hold of the book. It's an old, old, old book. But, you know, we need to be able to encourage people. If someone does, the, does a great job, tell them. They've done a great job. Uh, too often, people have been raised in the past where you didn't say any of those things. We didn't encourage people enough. And now we're in a, an environment where you, it's hard, harder to encourage because you're not allowed to give someone a hug. Uh, I watched um, Glenn Maxwell, is that his name? He gave a, a cricketer a hug. Now, you might not think much about that, but that poor young bloke was struggling. Uh, he can't speak the language. He has a stroke. That's not true. He can speak English, but it's not his native language. He's in a foreign country. He was stuck in isolation. And Glenn Maxwell realised that, and the guy had worked hard, 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 and really hard, and had failed on several occasions. Now, this is just cricket. You know, it's just cricket. But it was his life. It's what he was doing. And he, Glenn Maxwell gave him a hug. They made such a big deal of that, which was great, because we need to be doing more of that. But we're not allowed to hug people. We're not allowed right now to embrace people. We walk around and we go, oh, well done, tap on. And what's that? That's not sufficient. So we need to encourage people as best you can in the environment that we're in, unless you're happy to go to jail. I don't know what jail food's like. I know what hospital food's like. I don't know about jail food. So don't know. But we need to encourage people. We need to lift people up and build them up. And I think my last one, is that where I'm at now? Yep. Oh, where'd you go? Where am I now? I'm lost. Nine. I thought it was nine. Go to nine. Bag of fear and failure. There it is. Thank you. <sighs> First Chronicles 22. Anyone know what that says? Tells us that if we follow God's commands, he will give us success. Do not be afraid. If you follow his commands and do not be afraid, he will look after you. Proverbs 2, 6 to 8, tells us that he plans success for the descendants and the honourable. He guards the course and protects the way of his faithful ones. That's what God does. He sets a way for us and prepares a way for us to move forward. So this morning I have just a few other little things to say and then we'll close. But I really want to ask you this question. Do you trust God? Do you really? Do you really trust him? Now God's in the business of restoring people, isn't he? We, as you know, have a prayer chain. Now I'm not at liberty to share with you what's on our prayer chain because you're not on it. But if you're on our prayer chain, you'll know. But we've had people that we've prayed for last year that have had amazing results, spectacular recoveries. God is in the business of answering prayer. And if we're faithful in prayer and hang in with the Lord, he will do what he's promised to do. We've had people with cancer restored. We've had amazing things happen. And I just want to encourage you this morning that if you... Even if you personally don't trust. I prayed for somebody not too long ago. They really didn't have any idea what God was or who God was. But the last results of clinical tests was that God answered the prayer that was prayed and the results were amazing. And that's, what the, that's the business that God's in. Now, he doesn't always heal, does he? He doesn't always restore, does he? But it doesn't mean that God isn't faithful. I've been thinking about this area of life now for some time and I realise uh, I'm going to spend whatever time. Uh, I have a personal plan for 120 plus years. All right? That's my personal plan. Uh, now, if God changes that, that's fine. But what does that mean? What does that actually mean? It means that I go from here to there, to heaven, doesn't it? And how long will I be in heaven for? Forever. 
It's an infinity. We don't know. We have no idea. So I've often said to doctors when they say, oh, well, you know, this could be the end. That's right. I'll go to heaven early. Uh, it's okay. So if God doesn't answer you, don't give up on God. Go and find out, well, what, what does God want? What's his plan? If it wasn't for that to happen, which could have been your thought, but God, what did we read before? God's, I know the plans I have, says the Lord, for your life. God says, I know the plans that he has for your life. Are you committed? Are we committed enough to say, Lord, here is my life. Do whatever you want to do. Do your thing. When I was saved, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I have had no church background. I didn't go to church and that sort of, I didn't have that. My parents didn't go. They sent us to Sunday school and they stayed home. So I went to St. Chad's at Chelsea. When I was there, all I can remember doing was colouring little squares and stuff and got a stamp. That's all I can recall of my time there. But when I got saved and I read my Bible, I was able to apply whatever the scripture says. So I remember standing in my workplace with my hands like this and saying this, Lord, you gave me skills and abilities. I give them now all to you. And that's all I prayed. So, and I gave myself over to the Lord. I gave my hands and my skills. Right then I was uh, doing machining, tool making. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be going to do this, I might as well do it for the Lord. So, and he enhances your skills. It's what he does. If you're able to just say, Lord, I commit this to you, me, I give myself to you now, I promised you this morning that he'll pick you up and he will do his best to transform you, provided you don't hang on to things. So John 8.31, how many of you know John 8.31? Some of you will. Um, uh, I know Matt knows this scripture. He's got this scripture down. Matt 8, uh, Matt 8, John 8.31. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus went on to say again, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus has set you free. Jesus has set us all free. That's his job. That's his plan. That's why he came. So this morning I ask you again, do you trust him? Are you brave enough to give your life over to him and say, Lord, here I am. Clear the baggage. Clear the baggage. Now, the scripture says that the devil, the enemy, flees. Is that right? He has to flee because he's defeated. But what does it say he will do? In Matthew's gospel, it says you put him out of the house. Eventually, he's going to come back and have a look. If he finds the house empty, he will go and bring seven of his mates who are seven times worse than he was, and they will come and reside in the house. So what do you do? You cast out these things. You say to yourself, right, say to the Lord, I'm getting rid of this then you fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. So when they come, it says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Some translations say, I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the one that I use, abundantly. So the enemy comes back and he goes, you know, and he actually doesn't knock, he tries to get in. He'll do everything he can. He'll trip you up, he'll make you do something. He'll make you say, oh, it's not done. I haven't done it yet. And he'll seize the moment, all right? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So we should be able to, and I want to encourage you to throw off everything that hinders and every sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary 
and lose heart. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Lord, we pray as we gather here this morning that, Lord, every, every piece of baggage that we carry, we lay it out before you this morning and we say, Lord, would you take it? I give it to you this morning. I hand my life back to you and I pray that in Jesus' name, you would take me up, Lord, that you would take hold of me and that you would cause me to become the person that you want me to be here in this place this morning. Do you trust me? That's my question. Do you trust the Lord? And everyone in the room will sit here this morning and say, yes, I do. So Lord, as we surrender ourselves afresh this morning, would you transform 2021 in our lives? Would you transform us, Lord? Would you enable us through the power of your spirit to put aside every piece of baggage that we've been carrying? And we give you thanks for the opportunity this morning to be renewed and set free. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the people did say it.